Welcome to the No Question About That. Daily, we are going to talk about Ruben Amarin, Gary Cosserell, and the art of a respectful interview. All right, with Wayne. How are you doing, Wayne? Yeah, I'm good. I um, I was going to say calm down from this. Um, I hadn't really. I was, but I got distracted um, because, as you know, before we came on air, I was looking for my socks. So that distracted me from the Cotterill emergency in my brain. And then when you said it, when you mentioned his name, the red rage um, rose within me. Um, so I'm so yeah. glad we get to talk about this. I'm so glad. Joy, well, I'll post a little clip right now and then we'll come back. For your new club. You could be a hero even before you get on a plane to Manchester. Has that crossed your mind? In English, please. Mm, sorry, I cannot speak in English now. Um, Why? Sorry. Why? Sorry. They will miss me in Portuguese, <laughs> so I have to speak Portuguese. They've had about 25 minutes in Portuguese. I know, I know. We want 10 seconds in English. We'll proceed in Portuguese. Next week, you can hear him talking English. Okay. Yes. More basic English. It's like okay. a cold shoulder to all your English fans. <laughs> no, sorry. All right, we're back. I just thought I'd remind people of what happened. Uh, so Gary Cotterell goes over to Lisbon, is sporting versus Manchester City today, Tuesday night, uh, Portugal time. And he asks Ruben Amarin for some, uh, some quotes. He says, you could be a hero before you even set foot in Manchester. Uh, tell us what that's like, some whatever nonsense. And uh, then he gets all entitled and demands that you speak in English, uh, mm. uh, which is just, I mean, it's Gary Cotterell. I, I, if you remember when he doorstepped Eric Ten Hag, I tell was us. like, yeah. yeah, tell us how you're feeling. Tell us, tell us what it's like. Tell us what it's like. And uh, the security guard wouldn't get him anywhere, wouldn't let him anywhere near him. It was like, stop pushing me. Stop pushing me. You're live on TV. <laughs> so, or, or I, I was reminded uh, watching uh, Sam Peoples on his um, his channel uh, how uh, Gary Cotterell spent weeks in Dortmund <laughs> uh, following the Jadon Sancho transfer years and years ago and all that kind of stuff. So he has form. Anyway, you said red mist descended. This made you angry. Um, yeah. I mean, angry might be a bit strong, uh, to be fair. But like you said, you know, like he gets entitled. No, because to get entitled, you have to go from a place of not being entitled. I just think that he thinks he is entitled, um, as the ten hour thing shows. But <laughs> Ed, anyone with um, an ounce of investigative quality within them will surely have looked on Gary Cotterell's profile where um, it seems like a dedicated love account to Jose Mourinho. Yeah. Um, to, I think he was fairly... Um, his nose was put out of joining the United um, at the temerity to sack their manager because he'd done a sit-down interview with um, Mourinho and he wanted that to air and that's going to get postponed now. But he said, I've just sat down with United's most... Um, successful post manager, post, post Ferguson manager, and they've dismissed the the least successful. And I thought, no, objectively speaking, they are both the most. Now, unfortunately, no matter which way you spin it, they are both the most successful. Unless you're really carry, carry, counting the charity shield, which I do not. So, objectively speaking. He's actually, yeah. and, he, and even if you're not objectively speaking, if you do count the community shield for whatever reason, you want to count that as a major trophy, he's still the second most. He's not the least. The least, unfortunately, is David Moyes. And there's wow. a sliding scale True. of different managers there. Um, but he's, um, it, it, it's curious to me that his dedication to Jose Mourinho, and that's what it is, because that's where his influence from. I didn't know where that had come from. I thought, like you said, it was in his entitlement because I remembered the Ten Hag thing straight away. But it's not. It's to do with Mourinho and the way that he talks about him. He was completely taken in by Mourinho's charm. So he's one of these, um, the old school reporters who refuses to believe that Mourinho is past a prime now. He, mm. he thinks that he's still at his prime and he believes in all that um, 
guff about, you know, you should still have a top club and everything like that. When all the evidence, unfortunately, so just you know, not. I, yeah. I would have liked Mourinho to be successful because I want Manchester United to be successful. Um, unfortunately, didn't happen, Mr. Cotterell. No. It's, it, I mean, it does kind of give credence to the view in many parts of the world that the English media or press corps, especially, are extremely arrogant yeah. and uh, and entitled, right? And this was arrogance and entitlement personified that that in a press conference about sporting for the Portuguese media, predominantly conducted in Portuguese, that somehow he, Gary Cottrell, is so important that he gets to dictate what's actually going to happen and yeah. uh, that you get this kind of awkward moment with the press officer saying uh, you'll have plenty of time to talk to him in English when he gets to Manchester. Um, this is uh, this is the Portuguese press. And of course, apparently it's his last, well, at least last Champions League yeah. home press conference. Um, he's got he's got a couple of other games before uh, he departs. Where And I, I just like, think about it the other way around. You've got Manchester United versus Bodo Glimt at Old Trafford and uh, Norwegian press turn up and demand that Ruben Amorin talks to them in Norwegian and get really offended when he doesn't. Like, yeah. what the fuck? Well, uh, yeah. There's there's an element to it I understand from the aspects of they're playing in Manchester City and it is a global news story. So Manchester United are a different kettle of fish. I understand that. Um, but the way it's so bloody disingenuous, it, the reason why he wants to ask him a question is because he instantly wants to trip him up. And really... In a sense, you, you do get the sense because he's got a track record of doing this. And I don't like going in on someone, by the way. And I, I'm brought to mind of the little thing that he's got on the header of his uh, social media, which is yeah. effectively be kind or something like that. So I, I, Twitter would be a nicer, nicer place, he says. Yeah, so yeah, you're kind. I'm not, I, I'm not advocating for a pile on, a, on him, but... I just think like you were disingenuous. You were trying to lead him into a path. And at the worst, and I suspect it could be the worst, that he knew that he wasn't going to get an answer and he'd be able to portray him in the way that he's portrayed him because yeah, that's, yeah. that's what Maybe. he's got formed for doing. So yeah. what would what's the best case scenario? That he answers a, a question on United and he spins it of... Uh, either he, he charms him in the way that Mourinho charmed him so he can do some greasing of the wheels... Or he'll say something, or he instantly, before he started, before he started, get something that he's going to level at him. Now, we all know that that was the case because everyone now, and it's a bit of a bad case scenario for United because if City pump Sporting, which there's every chance that they, they could do no matter how good he is as a, as a manager, we know what the headlines are going to be. And Cotterell's just tried to steal a march in that. And I just think, like, for someone who preaches what he preaches to be so disingenuous as to try and be like the first, I mean, when, when really, when really, and I know I'm, I'm this is, this is where my gears are getting ground is you don't hear of Gary Cotterell. He's nowhere on the Manchester beat. He's got nothing to do with them. Like you said, that people are to remind, be reminded that he covered the Sancho story. So he's got nothing to do with Manchester reporting really for Sky because they've got different reporters on this. So he's just gone out there for whatever reason. And the only to time ever, moment. you only yeah. ever hear of him in the moment when United appoint a manager before they take the first game. That's the only time you ever hear of him. And then he disappears uh, in the Apparently. Mystery. All right, let's talk a little bit about Ruben Amarim because um, there are a few moments. I mean, not only his, his ability to deal with that, which I thought was... He tried to be charming. He made a bit of a joke about it. He brushed it off. He didn't get angry. I think he, it's a one perfect way of, of dealing with that thing. He let the press officer be bad cop. He was nice cop. He also gave uh, an interview to, or I forget what channel now, sorry. Uh, but in English, where he, he gave some thoughts on um, the upcoming game against Manchester City, and he was kind of detailed. He, he knows Sporting's place in this. I think he was realistic. He didn't get into a hyperbole. He, he just seems to have some gravitas, some charm, a bit of yeah. charisma. Uh, he likes to joke, uh, if you shut your eyes, he doesn't half sound like Cristiano Ronaldo, and I know 
Portuguese speakers will go, well, no, it doesn't. But, you know, to us dunderhead English little Englanders, uh, he does rather. Uh, we but get us Gary Cotterells over here. Us Gary, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's now a verb to cotter, to cotterell to make an embarrassment of yourself in public uh, <laughs> while behaving like a little Englander. But anyway, I, I, I think, like, I, I know I'm drawing a larger picture out of some small moments, uh, but in those interactions with the press, he's quite charming and personable. And I think that will serve him pretty well when it comes to being United manager. Er Eric Ten Hag is not, and I don't think that helped him. I, I know there are wider things like doing press conferences, um, especially amongst the, the journo core. They, they kind of think it's the be all and end all, and it's not. Is it? You know, there's so much more to being a United manager than how you deal with the press, but it's the very public facing part of it. And the only bit of what Gary Cotterell said that I almost slightly a modicum a kernel of agreed with was when he said, you're giving cold shoulders to your English fans. Now, I don't agree with that part at all, but the idea that the press are a medium through which a manager can talk to the wider Manchester United fan base is true. Now, it's not the only medium. There's club channels, there's social, there's... All or yeah, a whole other way of of interacting with supporters that is not through traditional press, but it's it's one way. And and yes. I think Ruben's charm, Ruben, because he's my best teammate now, uh, will serve him well. Yeah, um, I don't think it's a small thing at all. I, and I do. I didn't have as much a problem with Eric with the press as other people did because I think that there was a barrier there. And I think that that was probably healthy. Now, the interesting dynamic with this is that we talked before about the reductiveness of the managerial role at United, how many different irons are in the fire now and what the manager is actually there to do and what decisions he actually makes there and what, how suitable the title of a manager is at the moment for, for Manchester United. But it is there and he is a figure out of those decisions. So the ability to speak to the press, considering that's the one major role that he alone takes up, and I say he alone, I mean the manager of Manchester United, um, that they still retain the position of prominent footballing politician in English football. They still do. So that's the role that he's going to have to adopt. So to the extent that you wouldn't see this nonsense happen to any other club. It doesn't happen to any other club or any other, any other club's new manager. It hasn't happened and it doesn't happen. Um, I think there was a little bit with slot maybe. Um, so there might be a Liverpool fan who listens to this and pulls me up on it. Um, I don't know why, but, um, you know what I'm trying to say It is a, po a political position in, in football. Yeah. Um, you might even argue that. Well, cities is different now because it's become a political position because of the ownership structure and the dilemma that's gone on there. So not through choice, not through profile, through events that has become, I, sure. I don't think it will last as a political position, but it is one right now. Like Newcastle. Yeah, Manager although is one. City will 10x their viewership today for their uh, Champions League match because Ruben Amr I mean 10x is probably an exaggeration no, but, but yeah, it, it sure. will definitely be a peak no yeah. yeah for sure for sure I don't even by that there'll definitely be the interest to sort of um, put some kind of anti-United slant on it so anyway the point I'm making obviously is that there are now growing political positions in English football so managers and they would be probably Newcastle and City but only through their ownership not through size. The the two clubs that will retain that, and it will always be the case, are Liverpool and Manchester United. And Liverpool less so because they go insular into the community, whereas Manchester United always strive to try and be something different. They have ideas above the station, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. So it's something yeah. that they invite themselves as well. Um, I, I um, It is a kind of interesting point because he's going to be head coach rather than manager. And obviously the technical side, the recruitment side, the overall CEO, the director of football, uh, medical analytics have all got new heads. And so they put this major structure around, uh, which is to narrow down the focus of, of the manager, now the head coach, to 
taking the team, like building the, the, the game model, training the players, so on, so on, so on. And so it's a narrower scope. Um, and you would think when you put people up, like, since you're talking about the press and press conferences at the moment, and you'd think they'd only focus on that. Of course, he's going to get a lot of questions, which are way outside the scope of just games. So he will get questions when he turns up at United about transfers. Uh, about um, the ownership, about the new stadium, about the role in the community. He's going to, that, for sure, he's going to get all of that alongside sporting questions. Uh, and so how he handles that will will make a difference in terms of the coverage of United, how the ownership handle the rest of it, like how, how prepared are they to talk about the stuff that's in their domain? Because I don't think the head of medical is going to be part up in front of Sky Sports to talk about the injury crisis at United or... You know, how maybe touch wood, there won't be one when we uh, get the the new um, the coach in place. Who knows, right? Or uh, Ed, uh, or um, sorry, almost said Ed Woodward there, or uh, Dan Ashworth will uh, be up there talking about potential transfers, or Christian Vivell will be talking about scouting and so on. Like yeah. that's not going to happen, right? It will still mm. be um, Ruben Amarim who is there to take on that role, even though it's not. Yeah, take on that role to talk about it, even though it's not within his domain um, at the club, right? And they specifically signaled by this idea that he's the head coach. So that'll be interesting. Like, and he is not, to get back to Gary Cotterill, he is not there to serve the needs of Sky Sports to get their quote. So. Yeah. But, and Sky have been the worst for this to vilify the manager um, on the Wittenog. Um, and, and by the way, they weren't the only ones. I mean, I, I'll listen some rud of the times or maybe his first, after the Brentford game, she really went in on him and his mannerisms and his, uh, the, just the, his personality. Yeah. She was really, really cutting. And yeah, I, yeah. I feel again, like you don't get that. You haven't Her really seen are very that. absurdic in this kind of way that feels very, um, uh, shallow. Though. Yeah. And it was really personal as well. That, that was unnecessarily personal because. It doesn't, it shouldn't matter. I mean, I, it, I'm going to contradict myself because it should matter because it does matter. Regardless of whether he's right or wrong, it does matter. And the manager of Manchester United does have to be that political figure. So they do have to have this kind of um, personality about them. I didn't mind it too much with Tim Algo, like I said, because of the fact that I like the fact that there's a barrier there and I like someone who can cut back at the press like Louis van Gaal did. Um, I don't know if we're going to see that with Amarin. Like you said, he's very charming. And I wonder if there's not enough experience at the top to guide that, because I don't know if the people at the top, I don't know if yet Ratcliffe understands, or the Pete, you know, Ashworth and Wilcox or Barada. I don't know if these people understand that kind of political climate that goes in when something goes wrong at United and, and yeah. why they get targeted. And so are they the right people to advise him? Is he going to get the right advice from that? Is he going to know mm. that they'd never got good intentions? They, there's never going to be good intentions from the press. They, they might act like your friend. They might say you're charming to build you up and then you know, I mean, that's a very basic lesson with the press build someone up to knock them down, but especially with the manager of Manchester United, it, it, it can be, as we've seen with Ten Hag, that initial impression was so cutting that what we are now talking about it as being influential two and a bit years later. Sure. And yeah. yeah. Well, he'll turn up in Manchester on the 11th of November. He'll give an MUTV interview of some kind. I imagine it would be a nice softball, softball in order for him to introduce himself and then we'll see after that i mean ten Hag did some in-depth press interviews not loads but there'll be some of that and then we'll get the the weekly grind of the friday press conference at carrington and the midweek one ahead of the uh europa league games presuming that united are in there for some time to come we'll see well, on that one very quickly yeah. When he gives these interviews, what do you want him to say? What kind of thing? I mean, you know that there's going to be the, the same old stuff. What do you want yeah, him to sure. say? Yeah, sure. I don't expect him to give loads of details. I mean, I suppose he could talk about uh, what he expects, what his goals are for the team. I, I don't expect him actually to think about 
the, the overall big picture necessarily, because again, that's, that's Barada's job to, to think about the big picture now yeah. on the sporting side, it's, it's Dan Ashworth's job to make sure that all the, uh, all the structures that are in place and working so that Amarim is as successful as possible. So yeah, it'd be interesting if he wants to talk a little bit about tactics and team shape. He's not going to say anything negative or talk about gaps. Like why would he? I mean, maybe a year down the line after we've had a couple of uh, windows, he might talk about um, uh, gaps in the squad. I, I don't know. We just don't know him well enough yet. I mean, uh, if you think about what Mourinho did as soon as he didn't have what he wanted, he let everyone know. I'd be surprised. Mm. He doesn't seem like that kind of character, but I just don't know him well enough. Um, so yeah, initially, uh, yeah, it's just a, a, a sense of his vision for what this team is, um, articulated from his own mouths rather than a whole bunch of tacticos on the internet. Not you that know, I'm dismissing tacticos on the internet, cause there's definitely a place for that. You know him well enough to call him Ruben though. So there's that. Yeah. To be honest, every time I call him Ruben, it makes me hungry. Cause I'm thinking of a, like a Ruben sandwich. <laughs> Oh, Pastrami, mustard, pickles. Oh, nice. All right, let's leave it there. I'm going to go make myself a sandwich because uh, I've uh, worked up an appetite. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Ruben Amarim, dealing with the press corps. There's some challenging characters in there. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. 